institutional home buyers, let's define that as anyone who owns a thousand single family homes, they're doing some very interesting things in the country in real estate. And I don't think it's what most people expect. The one and only Lance Lambert from Resi Club has put out some focused articles on institutional buyers. So Lance, what'd you find? Yeah, so uh, Resi Club, this new media publication I've launched, I have four buckets that I'm really going to try to track uh, the best in media. Home building is one. Okay. Two, housing market analytics, uh, which I've been doing for a while. Um, uh, prop techs and real estate startups. And then the fourth is institutional investors and really the single family rental space. Because in my view, I don't think it's been covered well. I, yeah. I I don't think people really know exactly what's going on as well. And so I really want to be a good resource that is a resource that is like analytical, like, hey guys, like yeah. no spin, here's what it is. Here's the hard numbers. And uh, one company that's really been great at giving me data for this, because it takes a lot of work because the, you know these companies buy through LLCs and they roll up and there's just a lot going on and each state's different. And they go in and they watch every home in the US and they try to figure out the ownership of it and put it into different buckets. And that's okay. Parcel Labs. And they just did a new analysis. Can I share my screen? I believe so. So institutional investors, those owning at least a thousand homes, like you said, they own 0.73% of the U U.S. single family housing stock. Mm -hmm. So just under one out of every hundred homes. So it's like one out of, what is that? One out of one of five or something like mm -hmm. that. But the truth is, if you dig really deep into the numbers, what you will see is that while on aggregate, they're a very small player, it's still dominated by mom and pops and people with sure. five rentals, three rentals, 10 rentals. Uh, what you will see though, is that in certain markets of the country, they're, they're much bigger. And then within those markets, there are certain neighborhoods where more than 50% of all the single family uh, rentals are institutional, uh, which is interesting to see. And so in Atlanta, which is the, the market with the most, they own 4.4% of the housing stock there. And so this is a deeper dive. And what the data shows is that 36.8% of all institutionally owned single family homes can be found in just six markets. So oh, wow. almost 40% are in just six markets. And that's Charlotte, Atlanta, Tampa, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix. I was actually surprised. I thought Phoenix would be higher and I thought Las Vegas would be higher too. Uh, cause to me, those are the ones that I think of the most. Cause you know, you saw this in the housing, oh, yeah. box. they went in, they bought the bottom out in those right. markets just saw, um, very odd. Uh, I mean the, the troughs there were over 50% down, like they oh, were for sure. suppressed, yeah. suppressed. And to them, they just, you know, they saw dollar bills cause they knew that Resi at that point had, uh, had just fallen too far over sold. Um, and so in Atlanta, uh, uh, well, so I talked to this one guy, a broker there, and he said uh, that, you know, pretty much like what you said, they came in and they were the buzzards and yeah. uh, possums and just cleaning everything up at the bottom yeah, of the crash. Yeah. I mean, I remember the day that Fresno changed the, when they started buying everything at list price. I mean, I never, I bought a lot of property in the crash. I never paid list. These guys came in with their big ass checkbook and bought everything at list price. I mean, you couldn't compete. It was crazy. Yeah. And and one theory this guy has is that right now they're helping to keep the wheels turning for builders because of build for rent, uh, which is interesting. Yes. I think yes. it's possible that when we look back in a few years, there could be certain things that occur within home building and autos that kept the cycle running longer. Obviously, the STEMI money is one. The fact that the builders' margins got so high, and so now they and and the existing market has just been frozen and not given, right. and so been able to just come down a little bit on margin, pull yeah. you know, cut back on the size, you know, take incentives from cabinets and all this stuff, and throw it at the buy downs, and right. really just keep that economic activity rolling and keep this economy humming because you think the interest rate side would go, but we're getting off point uh, to keep it rolling and. 
during the pandemic, we saw very much a frenzy on the institutional side. We saw it on the small landlord side. We saw it on the Airbnb host side. We saw it on the institutional side. And the reason mm -hmm. being low rates, easy access to capital, soaring rents, soaring home prices. It, you just, it would be dumb not to be jumping in. Um, right. Everyone. Um, and so of the homes owned in Atlanta, 52% were bought in either 2020, 2021, which is the real big year for the pandemic housing frenzy on the institutional mm -hmm. side, or 2022. And then this year, only 3.6 of the homes through September mm -hmm. were bought this year. Um, so just which, so I understand these numbers. So you're saying, hey, I, I'm Joe Blow, institutional buyer. I own a thousand homes. Of those thousand homes, 520 of them would have been bought in the last three years. That's exactly. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Got now it. we're in a bit of a lull. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, what's really interesting, though, is when you pull back the numbers, 30% of their portfolio in Atlanta is in 11 zip codes. So think about wow, this. Wow, that's some concentration. Nationally, 13% of all institutional homes are in the Atlanta market. And then within Atlanta, one third are in 11 zip codes. So if you do the math, it ends up being like three or 4% of all institutional homes in the country are in these 11 Atlanta zip codes, which is just wow. kind of mind blowing. Wow. Um, and, uh, you know, Parcel Labs, what they think is that the Atlanta market, because it has a great long term outlook, uh, good demographics, good, uh, you yeah. know, all these factors and probably even like tenant laws, I'm sure is probably a factor too, that in the analysis of these different institutional companies, Atlanta kept coming up high. And so they all pushed into the market. So let me ask um, you a question. Let me ask you a question about this, because I think what we're seeing is a change in institutional buying behavior. So again, I was around when the institutional buyers were buying everything out of the MLS for, for, um, you know, pennies on the dollar. But to your point, that was that was spread out. Everything was on sale. So they were buying the entire book. What I think we're looking at here is the transition from buying old fixer uppers to paying somebody to do build for rent. And I'm going to buy a hundred homes at a time. Because I think that's why it's so concentrated. You're basically uncovering where the build for rent is happening. I think that's yeah. what's happening here. I, I think that's uh, I think that I think that's a big part of it is that the SFR where you're just ha you know having homes dotted all over the place yeah you know gets to be challenging for an operator whereas built for rent hey we got the whole community you know we can run this yeah. like a oiled machine it's right? just an apartment that's you know horizontal versus vertical right or whatever you want to say they're you know they're just the walls aren't connected. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And so I, I think that's probably a play. And this is one of those uh, Atlanta zip codes. And in this one, they own 13 percent of the single family stock. Uh, and, you know. Yeah. So quite... I'm going to get so this is great because I'm guessing there's 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 a heat map even inside this area, like in the middle left, there's a big they own a community there. The bottom that... tip. Yeah, exactly. The bottom tip. That's a community. All these little single dots. That was probably stuff secured yeah. you know a decade ago yeah but, exactly these ones are probably people got in financial distress yeah exactly and, yeah uh 10 years ago or 15 so years build ago. for rent is i just think build for rent's just starting right we're seeing this in atlanta it's funny i just talked to a phoenix agent this morning and she was saying build for rent's going crazy she thinks it's going to be the biggest thing in 2024 wow. at least in her market of phoenix yeah. and they're still raising capital for it for sure and when I was at the Blueprint Conference in Las Vegas, I talked to a VC who is putting money into uh, an institutional company that is doing build for rent, but only for Airbnbs. Like they're going to build Airbnb communities, short term. Rental Interesting. Community. I knew some people doing that, like boutique hotels that were they're all Airbnbs. Now we're going to do communities just for Airbnbs. That's wild. I guess. Yeah, I guess. Uh, huh? And this is so this is a different one. This is share of single family uh, homes for rent, and it's by the share that are institutional. So anywhere that is red, they uh, own, well, dark red especially, but they own almost half of the single family rentals in the market. 
So they are starting to really become big competitors and set the market rates in a huge swaths of Atlanta. Yeah. I'm, again, I this is now jumping off the page to me. I think this is just where they're planting build for rent communities. Like that one on the far right at 80%. They probably have two or three communities in there. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And well, and yeah, and, and that community, there's also a chance that some of these out here oh, for sure. could be communities where there's not many single family rentals. Right. Oh, that could be two. Yeah, it could be. They're not many. So they build a single family community. Like, let's say you get a build for rent community in a great school district. Right. That was probably not very many single family rentals, mm -hmm. uh, you right. know, very expensive, you know. And and so if you built something like that there, you could become a huge share very quickly. I no, mean, there's I Alaska that if I go buy a rental, I'm going to own 100 percent of the single family rental stock <laughs> if I go exactly. build something. Um, and so I, I think my big takeaway with this piece is while institutional firms are a small player in the overall U.S. housing market, uh, they can be big players in some park, pockets of the country. Um, yeah, I, I think that's clear. I think Atlanta is a great example. And the other thing I would point out is I think this story has just started. And to the earlier comment about Phoenix, I think it, I think they're going to pick new markets. They're not going to only focus on Atlanta. There will be yeah. the next Atlanta somewhere else yeah yeah and you know one thing that uh amher ceo told me is that because of how tax laws work in some in some states like states with higher state income taxes mm -hmm. i for and he was you know he's really smart he i yeah i was shocked how much into the economics he was getting with me on it but uh, something about how like states with higher property taxes and higher state um, income taxes, the economics don't work as well for single family rentals from his view. Uh, so my state was one that he said, Ohio, because, um, you know, we have like a six or five percent state income tax, but we also have high property taxes. Um, so, I, yeah, I got to look into that deep deeper to understand that. But it, essentially what he's saying is a lot of those Southern states are great for single family rentals for the institutional mm -hmm. side. Um, this is, so Invitation Homes just reported their earnings. Uh, they had been a net seller for three quarters, Q4 2022, uh, Q1 2023, and Q2 2022. It's gotten a lot of headlines. Uh, you know, I wrote about it at Fortune. Some of the YouTubers have. Uh, oh, really gosh, this drives me crazy. The crash bros and doomers. Institutional yeah. buyers are net sellers. Dude, they bought 60 and they sold 71. I mean, stop, stop talking nonsense. Yeah. So essentially what happened is that in late last year and then early this year, they were selling off the amount that they used to sell off the disposition. Correct. Yeah, but they really just stopped buying. They kind of froze the buying. And what happened is a lot of the cap rates just don't make as much sense. There's yep. no inventory churning on the market at the bottom where they buy. Yep. And it is what it is. And uh, so this quarter, they are once again a net buyer and boom, right up. We knew this was coming. And the reason is they got 1,870 homes from another institutional firm. When I reached out to them in July, when they announced it, they wouldn't tell me who it is, but I will it's say- It's Billionaire Barry. It's yeah, Billionaire Barry. That, that's what I think too. Um, oh, and so there's no fact, question. He was sell, shopping a portfolio of 1,900 homes. Uh, it was announced in July. They bought a portfolio of around 1,900 homes. Uh, Starwood announced that they got rid of around 1,900 homes. And yeah. then oh, and they officially in the earnings got 18, uh, just under 1,900 homes. And uh, when I looked at the the homes where they're at, they're kind of spread all over the place. Uh, yeah. So it does kind of look like they just absorb somebody's full portfolio. Mm -hmm. Because if you're abs absorbing somebody's portfolio, uh, that portfolio is going to be spread because you're not going to want to be regionally concentrated. Uh, yeah. So that's what I think. But, you know, I don't know it. And I'm a journalist, so I shouldn't say that I think that's what it is. Uh, but I, I am not a journalist, and I will say it. That's Billionaire Barry, folks. He had to raise cash because he had other problems, so he sold some homes. But that's just my and opinion. And if you get rid of the 1870, um, they were still a net buyer by five homes. Uh, so oh. 
Okay. Not the huge boom going out and buying a lot, but still. Net. But that shocks me. They were still a net buyer. That that yeah, surprised me. Including the eighteen seventy, yeah, because that was the one of the things I've been waiting to see with this quarter. So I knew they'd be a net buyer again. But were they still a net buyer uh, after affecting Starwood? And they were. Hmm. Um, okay. And then I was up a couple hours last night into the AMs doing this chart. I had to wow. manually go through all the earnings to get this. This is their portfolio by market for Q3s. Atlanta, interesting. Number wow. one, for the end the most. Uh, then Phoenix, which- oh, Hold on. Yeah, let me look at this. So again, back to Atlanta, right? They're not really adding new stock mm -mm. really for the last three years, right? Just onesie, twosie stuff. Yeah, so where, that big jump up in the Atlanta wasn't them. Yeah, where, so where did, they, where did they go up meaningfully? Uh, Phoenix has been one the past couple of years. Oh yeah, there we go. But they haven't really their portfolio. Oh, net selling. Look at that SoCal net sellers. Yeah, interesting. Yep, and, and South Florida, interesting. Oh, interesting. Oh, so they went up. Um, Jacksonville kind of. They've exited Nashville over the past couple of years. I wonder why that is. I always wonder why somebody gets out of a market. I wonder yeah. why they got out of Nashville. I have no idea. And one thing that was interesting is this portfolio that they took over really matched up with a lot of their current markets. They just threw on top a little here, a little there. So to me, that's probably why they bought it because it was- oh, Of course. It, 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 yeah. must have matched up with their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh. Again, they didn't get a new market because that would mean a new team, a new this, a new that. It was like, hey, we're just adding to what we already have. Makes to total sense. Yeah. Carolina- so that's interesting. But yeah, this is not one of the ones that's like huge, robust growth. Um, and again, Invitation Homes cut their teeth in the 08 crash. That's that's where they were born, right? Yeah, it, it, exactly. Yeah. And if you actually go, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like they they were something created out of it, essentially. Right, um, right. And so Invitation Homes is sitting on a portfolio of, I, I'm going to call it older homes because they were buying anything they could. They have do they talk about buying build for rent? Has Invitation Homes done a build for rent? Um, I, they, there was something on build for rent uh, uh talked about uh recently with them. I gotta look into it again. Uh, but there's you know a lot of build for rent going on uh right now. Um so I let's do let me do some more research sure. and uh get some more uh on the ground reporting on that. Oh, of course, I'll, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's and then I, I uh, yeah, it, build for rent's going to be something to watch. And next week we have American Homes for Rent report. Oh, oh, very cool. Yeah, so it, it's earning season. We've had four builders this week. Yeah, yeah. So why don't we, why don't we just jump into that? Unless you got some more uh, on institutional buyers, why don't you talk about what you saw from the uh, builders? Yeah, we can do builders. Yep, let me go. I have a story on that as well. Um, have you found a way to create like a thirty-hour day or something? Because you get so much done, it's wild. Yeah, yeah. I'm really stretching myself uh, out of the gate. But uh, one thing that's good is I like the, some of my charts. Like this one took me through like two or three hours last night. Okay. I was up probably one doing it. But now that I have it, every quarter will be easier to update. Yeah, this chart, that makes sense. I already had this chart, and so I just added the new numbers. This took me like sixty seconds to do. Got it. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, so efficient is what I got to do. Uh, fortune 500 home builder just made it clear. They are gunning for the small builders. This is a Zuber talking point for quite some mm -hmm. time. So I, I don't know if you're going to do a, a little nailed it, but this is one of the things you've been talking about, which nailed is it. <laughs> big builders. They have the balance sheets. Uh, they have the support on the mortgage side. I mean, Pulte group has an in-house mortgage company. Yep. Uh, these small builders just don't have that. And, um, and so he said, you know, it gives us the opportunity to do things that small and local builders can't. Yep. I can't even access my own story. Yeah. Um, That's funny. Uh, give no, me a yeah. But this, this, uh, I'm already playing this out six or nine months, Lance, because I see a very big, potentially very big problem come next April, May, June. We might see shelter inflation pick back up. Because we have more builders exiting, we have less new inventory. We it's just, it's it's frightening to think about. It's a little early to think that far ahead, but that's something that's concerning to me. Is 
we could see shelter inflation reignite. Yeah, well, well, so you still have softening on the rental, especially on the multifamily side. Correct. Still more softening probably to go uh, by coming on the market there. Single family rentals is still inching up a little bit. And then house prices after giving up a little bit, especially in the West and some of these uh, boom towns is now, uh, you know, is moving back up. And so by the end of the year, we'll probably be up 3% year over year on house prices, single family. And, you know, so, you know, the Fed hit it uh, and they rolled over the appreciation rate, decelerated everything. I, you know, I had a story out this week and looking back, it's kind of like the great deceleration. You're going from the fastest growth rates ever yep. on rents yep. and house prices. Boom, you hit it down, you go down to almost zero, maybe minus one and then back up. But you can only pull that trick out of your bag once, right? Once. You only right. slam the brakes like that once. Um so it, it'll be interesting to kind of see how that moves forward. Let me, okay, so I have it now. Am I good to share? Yeah, please. Okay, so here's the story. This one this one only went out to the Resi Club Pro subscribers. Actually, this is my draft of the story. So give me a second. Okay, this one looks like it might be the final. Um, this went out to my pro subscribers. Uh, here is the revenue and net income for oh, Pulte. Oh, wow, look at that. Uh, yeah. As you can see, revenue and profits in the 08 crash fell way down. Uh, yeah. A decade of um, moving up, uh, a, a hiccup here, um, but still, you know, fairly elevated. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, the sales and the profit. So this is the gross margin. Um, still fairly high, you know, down just a hit, little bit from the very tippity tip, but, you know, far above pre-pandemic levels. So they still have cushion to do things. And yeah. This if, is- if you, if you were going to average time. that, Lance, if you're going to average that over the last, oh, that's 20 years, we, we just 15% kind of feels like the average looking at that just roughly yeah, 15, 20. It's somewhere in here, I think. Yeah. So they, they roughly have they they, when I talk about builders having fat margins and they can eat margin to buy down and do those things. It's, 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 this is the chart that I was looking at. I'm like, they got plenty of room. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And this is with doing five and 6% fixed rates. Yes. Um, this is, I like this chart a lot. It's net new orders and homes in backlog. So as you can see, moving in to the bubble, and this is very important for a historical look back. What you started to see is a huge divergence in net new orders and homes in backlog. Their homes in backlog started to build faster than net new orders were going up. They got a huge backlog. And then over a three-year period, net new orders just kept falling, kept falling, kept falling. There's so much existing inventory on the market. And this was occurring even before the crash happened. So it worked. Absolutely. You know, it was a, it was, you know, it was, you know, what is that called when you're watching something in slow motion? That's a uh, train wreck. Yeah, it's a train wreck yeah. in slow motion. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. Um, and then a, a long recovery. Um, and then during the pandemic, you see the biggest jump up as work from home really takes off. Right. And then you see it come down a bit. This is coming down off the highs. And then I would describe this drop as the mortgage rate shock. Correct. Um, But then what you've seen, and this is very, very important, this this part right here, net new orders has now went back up Mm -hmm. and homes in backlog are going down. This This is why I am concerned about inflation next summer, because we already know existing home sales and that part of the market is freaking broken. Now we have builders blowing out inventory. With by buying rates down, hence the blue bar or purple, whatever that color there is. And oh, by the way, they're slowing down future bills. So we could get to the spring selling season with no new homes and no existing home. That's my, that is my, and dude, Lance, if rates fall, oh my God, I'm yeah. like, this could get batshit crazy. And uh, last chart here, just if anybody's interested to know where Pulte plays, uh, Florida's their biggest market. Um, actually, if you combine Florida and Texas, that's like 40% of their market. And they have a small Northeast presence, 5%, Midwest 15, 
Southeast is pretty big, 19%. And then the West, all of these states, 18%. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, folks, if you're not following Resi Club, I don't I don't know what you're doing. If you Resi Club free, uh, five articles a week, I believe. Resi Club Pro, three additional articles plus access to his charts or in data set. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, anything you want to say to wrap this up? No, I, I think that's it. Uh, just uh, keeping an eye on the institutional side, home builders, prop techs, and then all these regional housing markets. Very cool. Thank you for all you do, Lance. You're amazing.